Well, good evening. Good evening. Oh, my pleasure indeed to finally have the opportunity and, uh, and arrive here for what I hope will be a delightful discourse. Now, that is a conversation upon any subject that you would like to put forth uh, for our general interest, a conversation directed by your questions. An open and free inquiry, that has always been my greatest delight, and which as American citizens we must never, ever neglect. It is the public controversy. It is the public debate, the public argument more than anything else, which will continue to protect and defend our natural rights. Well, this is not only the American argument. This is indeed the argument that has continued throughout time in memoriam and throughout the family of man across this globe. And let us recognize thereby that these are the rights that are given not only to all of us as Americans, but indeed the rights that are given to the family of man, not by any government and not by any chief magistrate, but rather these are the rights that are given to us by nature and nature's God. So how well we incur his favor and engage his benevolence when we engage these rights. So rest you assured, as history has shown, if we do not, we may lose them. So I look forward to your questions. I look forward to your concerns and, and your arguments as I've looked forward these last several months to finally take leave of Washington City, which perhaps you have read I often refer to as a swamp of politics. Uh, <laughs> oh, it is. We cannot deny physically that Washington is a swamp, uh, the general vicinage of the confluence of the Anacostia with the Potomac River. Uh, presents to us a, a swamp which we are ever endeavoring to, to fill in, though uh, happily the capitol building of our nation stands majestically upon Jenkins Hill and the President's House upon uh, Davis Hill. But no, Washington is a, a sea of politics, which I have referred to often. Politics is a boisterous sea upon which one rarely, if ever, sights land. But I hope we realize that it is a necessity Politics is a necessity of a free people. To ever be engaged for the ultimate art and the end of politics is compromise and resolution for the public good. And so therefore, yes, I set out from Washington City once more, much to the exasperation of the Federalists. Oh, perhaps you've read as well in the newspapers, they continue to accuse me of taking more vacations than any other United States president. Well, considering there have only been two before me, I do not think that any great accomplishment by, by any means. But citizens, I do enjoy to get out of Washington City because, well, because simply I can travel incognito. Nobody knows who I am. Oh, could you imagine if a president's likeness could be duplicated in the newspapers the same way as words and sentences are? Everybody would know what he looks like. He'd never have a moment of solace in his life. But no, I can travel unknown throughout our land and thereby enjoy conversations directly with my fellow Americans, to hear the concerns of our citizenry, to hear their grievances, and to hear the number of names they use to describe the President of the United States. That has, that has been my delight. It is indeed to hear their opinions that I might be more directly connected then uh, to the voice of the people. Oh, indeed. As the Romans used to say, vox populi, vox dei, the voice of the people is ever the voice of God, therein nature shall speak. I, I forgive you, oftentimes I lapse into Latin phraseology, though perhaps because I've ever delighted in the study of those people and their fantastic civilization and forms of government. Oh yes, I do refer to myself as an antique Roman in many, many ways, with a great reverence for a republican government. But no, citizens, I'm happy to finally arrive here after these last three weeks in the saddle. That is how long it has taken me to, to ride these 650 miles from the President's house to your vicinage here, a vicinage that uh, is inhabited by this fam family, uh, the Flambois, uh, is that the name, Madeline and Joseph, who have established this settlement at Ada, uh, devoted to, to trapping. I'm astounded by your wilderness up here, and the more gratified that when I was a boy, all that was in the Northwest, particularly about the Great Lakes, was referred to as Northwest Virginia. So I, <laughs> I feel indeed a, a great familiarity uh, with all of you, you here. And uh, I must admit, I think I've made some pretty good time on the road. Uh, 
as many of you know who own a horse, uh, you can never ride more than about 35 or 40 miles a day, so as not to tie out your horse, let alone yourselves, and you'd never ride any faster in the saddle than about, oh, five miles an hour. That is a comfortable pace. If you've tried to ride, oh, six, seven miles an hour over a long distance, well, you'll soon discover it's unsettling to the digestion. And consider, if you will, most people across the globe do not even own a horse. Horses are expensive, particularly to purchase and to breed properly, to maintain. Is that not provocative to think that the majority of people across this globe travel from one place to the other? Well, how so? They walk our own God-given method of transportation, our own two feet, which will take you comfortably about three miles an hour, which is a curious scientific point to ponder, is it not? The average rate of speed upon this globe, all of these centuries and millennium, uh, between the privileged, the few that own a horse and travel comfortably at uh, five miles an hour, and uh, yet the great majority, the common man who continues to walk comfortably at three miles an hour. Well, there you have it in your calculation. After all of these millennium, it still remains a four mile an hour world, does it not? <laughs> that is the world I know. I know of no place upon the globe where you can travel any faster than a ship at sea or a horse on land. Oh, I know there have been remarkable modern contrivances, this steam and powered mechanical device that they placed in a boat back in 88 and placed a boat upon the Delaware River to sail against the current. Oh, it still could not travel any faster than one may achieve upon horseback. And yes, Mr. Leeper in the city of Philadelphia placed the same steam and powered engine in a cart, placed the cart on two rails parallel to be propelled forward. That still cannot travel any faster than one may accomplish speed on horseback. And I hear there will be a further improvement this year, 1807. Uh, my good friend, Mr. Robert Fulton, is working with our mutual friend, Mr. Livingston of New York, and they are collaborating on a much more improved steam empowered engine. A citizen, my point for this uh, divergence is to consider, consider indeed, without any mechanical device, without any modern technology, the art of mechanics and science, simply the human mind and our own two hands has created the United States of America. Is that not truly remarkable? To think that we are the first people in the history of mankind to finally establish a nation upon principle, not upon monarchy, nor upon aristocracy. This is a remarkable achievement, long argued and debated throughout the history of mankind, and finally put into effect as the American experiment of self-government. I would tell you that as I was dismounting out of doors, taking off my riding boots, putting on my city shoes here, um, preparing to come in, I discovered that I was still somewhat musty and dusty from the road, and I thereby thought I should provide you an apology for my unkempt appearance and my, my well, rather dusty dress. Though, as I was introduced, my Madame de Didier, as I ascended the dais to walk here and gaze out amongst you, I, no, I do not know why I should apologize for my curious <laughs> dress here this evening. I've always believed in dressing for comfort, but you overwhelm me in that respect here tonight. And, uh, and I do then realize that I'm perhaps more the overdressed upon this occasion. And what has become quite the modern fashion in a gentleman's suit of clothes, uh, as perhaps you've noticed since the turn of the century, the gentlemen have cut away their old frock coats now, those frocks were so fashionable before, doing after the American Revolution, buttoning right down to your knees. Gentlemen as well have cut away their waistcoats. And I will agree, this provides a greater comfort in the saddle, and I am never a day out of the saddle. There's no excess now of material to, to worry about. And perhaps you've noticed the, the old tri-corner hat. Remember how fashionable that used to be before, during after the American Revolution. Well, now that is looked upon as old-fashioned, and they say the gentlemen are now beginning to sport proudly their top hats, taking on a rather rigid style, though I still prefer floppy felt for my comfort. 